now. And that's a company that deals with commercial shipping, so all the large ships you see out there, container ships, uh, gas tankers, chemical tankers. There's a lot that goes into operating them. Most of them are almost floating nations in their own right, uh, with you know, six or seven countries involved in every single decision. So we help build software, AI, a lot of different tools to optimize, manage all of those things with an eye to the people that actually work on those vessels and the people that are actually served by those vessels. Finally, I think, and I only say this to, to tell you about the kind of perspective I've got, right? I've seen invested in quite a few companies and I consult and advise a large number of companies. So I have the unique experience of having built a company myself, but I see a lot of founders. I see a lot of founders go through a lot of different stages in a lot of different countries. So some of these things are just amalgamated learnings or observations from my side, from what I've seen. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I wondered if we'd cut this for time, but I think this is a useful exercise. I'm not going to make you guys actually uh, say them out loud. But you might have some things come up in your head when you see these questions. Think about them for a little bit. Maybe write them down somewhere. Have, a, have an idea of it. Because the way that we talk about these things, we're going to see how that shapes your answers. Right? So who was your favorite company? You know, who do you look up to? Who's your favorite person? What's inspired you? OK, so the biggest question when you start is why, right? And the simplest answer I can give you, you know, it's not easy for me to tell you that a startup is your best path to money. For a lot of you, it's not. Uh, that a startup is your best path to success. Most of you, it's not. But it's your fastest way, and sometimes it's your only way to capture exponential outcomes. And exponential outcomes are kind of what drive us as a species, right? When we discovered farming, that was an exponential outcome. When we discovered the wheel, that was an exponential outcome. AI, which you know, I think everyone's a little tired of hearing about, is also an exponential outcome, because you see these large inflection points, and, and those things happen. When startups and companies talk about scaling and efficiency and marginal cost, they're really talking about capturing the exponential outcome. And there's a guy on YouTube or your friend that talks about Bitcoin. He's probably talking about exponential outcome. When people talk about multi-level marketing, they're also talking about exponential outcomes. But not all of them are necessarily good. But the reason I say that is just to say that our world is driven by exponential outcomes. And startups or entrepreneurship are your best path to capture them for yourself and be part of that. Because there's a lot that you can do with a traditional career path. But in most cases, it's rarely exponential. And the one good example that I always use is that humans are so wired for exponential outcomes that we don't even notice it. Uh, the volume slider or the brightness slider that we're all familiar with on, on our rooms, on our computers, those are actually exponential, if you didn't know. So when you go from 10% volume to 20%, it's actually doing a 10x. When you go from 20% to 30%, it's actually doing another 10x. So our brains and our minds actually expect exponential movement across different scales. And a startup is a good way to be part of that, as you know, the human race goes through these things. The second one, I think, is it's a good way to learn. And I think that matters more than just learning as an end of itself. At least in the early parts of your career, the thing that holds you back most is a lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of how different careers function, different job roles function, how the world really works, how capital moves, how capital gets distributed, how customers are served. And startups are a great way to understand all of these different things. Uh, it's, you can do any job you want. You almost have to do any job you want. So any job that's in front of you. So it's a great way to learn all of those things. And the, the final one that I think I, I, I do still get questions about is, is it still seen as kind of high risk? And to me, that couldn't be further from the truth, right? I think there's a high risk way to do entrepreneurship, but there's a high risk way to do anything. And most of those things you'd still consider high risk even outside of entrepreneurship. If you borrow way past what you can to start a company, that's high risk regardless of whether you were doing it for a startup or a BMW. If you commit fraud and you embezzle money, that's high risk regardless of whether you did it inside of a company or outside. But if you do it in a healthy way, I think there's, there's a lot of value that can, that can come from that. Every single founder, every single person that I've seen go in and start a company has come out better than they went in. There might be people that I, that I just haven't seen, but every single person I've seen, and I've seen a lot, have come out better than, I've, uh, than they've gone in. They've come out learning more about themselves, about the world, with more respect from the people around them, regardless of whether they succeeded or failed. Uh, in some cases, with more money. And in a lot of cases, just with a better idea of where they fit into the world, where they can contribute to the world, and where they're valued in the world. 
Look at sheet. How often do you think startups fail, and why do you think they actually fail? That, that's a good question. It's something we were just talking about. Uh, it's not always what you think. The 95% of startups that I've seen fail because of people. If they succeed, it's often because of people. It's not because they ran out of money. It's not because they didn't find product market fit. It's not because they were working on the wrong thing. It's people. Most of the companies, and I've been fortunate enough to go through you know, uh, and, and be part of systems like Entrepreneur First, or Y Combinator, or a lot of these. And these are large cohorts. And in being large cohorts, they're case studies for startups, most of them fail. And you can ask anyone who works there because of people, because the people in them couldn't work together, because the people in them couldn't necessarily like each other when things got tough. It's almost always people. So uh, once you get this far, the next question is, what do I actually have to offer? And the first one there, the most important one, is just fresh eyes. In the, oh man, <laughs> I, I wish we had transitions, because there's a few pictures there. Uh, is there, do you have a personal experience where having a fresh set of eyes actually made a difference? I, I think quite a few, right? I think uh, the most, most uh, memorable one that I can think of is the one from reinsurance. Because reinsurance is a complex industry, right? You come in. And then when you go in, you have a bunch of very, very dumb questions, right? You have questions like, why does that happen? Or why does you know, one country's farming risk actually get moved to another country? And it turns out sometimes those are the right questions to ask. Sometimes those questions have a lot of financial value behind them. And experts don't ask that question because they were tired of asking that question when the answer was no, you shouldn't ask that question. And so the, 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 the really uh, interesting thing that's, that's slightly hidden there is in Zen, the, there's a concept called the beginner's mind, which is a mental state that you occupy, which is a mental state that is prized because oftentimes the beginner can see what the expert can't because you're too connected to preconceptions of how things actually are. And in most cases, that's what you're trying to do. Not just with startups, but any other career, as you go out and you do, do your things, you're trying to change the status quo. When you pick up a new habit, you're trying to change the status quo. Oftentimes, not knowing what the status quo is, is a massive, massive advantage, if used the right way. All right, I'll just ram for a bit. So if you start a health tech company right now, what is the first step you will do, and why will you do it? So that's, that's a good question. Uh, in terms of, and, and it's, it's also a good case study in how to approach these things. I've never started a health tech company. A couple of my friends actually have. The few things you want to watch out for when you start in something new is three main things. You want to look at who your customers are. You want to look at what your unit economics are. And these things, I think you've heard before, they get drilled into you. And you want to look at what your edge is, right? My biggest edge, if I said I was going to go into health tech, is I don't necessarily have one personally. But it's also always about finding your unique perspective, right? Um, I, one of my, uh, someone that's very close to me in my network has diabetes. So that's a very high quality source of information for me to learn more about something from a personal lens as someone who's directly affected. That's an edge, right? Now, the question about a lot of health tech companies that they forget is also about compliance and the unit economics and change as you operate them. So that would be a good way to think about it. Oh, should we go back? So the, the two other things I just want to uh, touch on is one big advantage you have as a startup that I don't see most, a lot of startups use, but the most successful ones I've seen use it like 100%, is that they can have very narrow-minded focus in niche areas, and they can have incredible cornering velocity. The picture that's right back of here where I've been a drag racer, and most companies today, most large companies, the companies you're going up against, the companies you're working with, are kind of built like drag racers, right? They're, and you can Google this if you want to see what they look like, but they, they don't look like the cars you know. They're designed to put power down on the ground in one direction as much as they can, right? They're incredibly horrible at, tr at turning or doing anything else that's needed of a car. And that's what most companies are. The competitive pressures that you face when you're a large company in a very competitive industry means everything else gets whittled away from you until all you're doing and all you're good at, and you have to be, is going in a straight line. So consider trying to get them to do anything else is really, really difficult. And if you've ever worked inside of a large company, you know this. Whereas startups look kind of like this. You know, startups look, uh, honestly, being in a startup, it looks exactly like this. It's pretty beat up, bunch of parts that don't really fit. But what it's really good at doing is going anywhere and turning into any direction. And that's your key advantage.
and you're almost building it down the road. The people that raise these things kind of rebuild them almost every single day, which is what you have to end up doing. The uh, final thing, and I think we're slightly over time, uh, the final thing is just around making a difference. This gets thrown around a lot, and it comes to me a lot, and so I feel like it's worth commenting on, is oftentimes the question is, how do you make a difference? And I think sometimes that's the wrong question. The right question there is, how do you contribute? Making a difference happens usually when you're not looking. That happens when those exponential outcomes, those inflection points catch up to you. When you've done enough into the world and you've done enough work in all of these different things, you'll do it and then you won't notice that you did it. And then one day you look back and you go, that actually did make a difference. Oftentimes the right question you ask when you try to figure out where you want to go is, where can I contribute? Where can I add value? And that's usually an easier question to answer. So the, the, the next one is, what then do I work on once I start, right? Uh, hopefully these are a little understandable, but they're kind of stacked on top of each other. Uh, the first answer there really is it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what you want to work on. That's almost like asking, you know, what kind of shoes do I buy to train for a marathon when you haven't started? The answer really is start. Start and respond to problems, because that's honestly the only skill you need is start and get really good at responding to problems. There is no amount of prep that will keep you from needing that skill. And if you're good at that skill, that you, you honestly don't need as much prep as you think. Figure out what you want out of it. And I think there, uh, thankfully, this triangle is sort of the, the important one. It's kind of become my rubric. I don't think it was mine. I think I got it from someone else. I've forgotten now. Uh, but it's really that triangle of people, work, and money. Right? And it's an important sort of question, litmus test to ask yourself of what's really important to you. Oftentimes, we get caught in these scarcity mindsets. You know, I need money. I don't have enough money. I'd like to make money. That it's hard to crystallize what you actually do have until you put it into something. So the question there is, and I think it applies to all of you guys, applies to me, um, is look at yourself in 10 years. Right? If in 10 years, let's just say we pick work. You're, you're working on something you absolutely enjoy and that fulfills you every single day. You're making a difference and you really enjoy what you're doing. But you don't make a lot of money, you make enough to survive, and you hate the people you do it with. That's option one. Option two is you are making as much money as you can think of today times 10. But you think you're doing absolutely nothing for the world and you still hate the people you work with. That's option two. Option three is you love the people you work with. You've got their respect, you respect them, and you wake up every morning and you're happy to see these guys. But you don't make a lot of money and you don't do anything that you think is worth doing. What was the visceral reaction internally? What was your internal mental reaction? One of those worlds probably felt better than the other two. That's a good starting point. That tells you a little bit about how you're wired. And the people that I've had this conversation with, the people that I've asked, I've gotten all sorts of answers. Right? Based on how you think and who you are, you get a pretty easy idea. And if you want to take it further, you can slowly start changing these things and go, you know, if I had two of those things but I lost one of them, which one would I hate? Right? And you can sort of go from there. Honestly, quick question. Who picked, uh, who picked money? See, you can, you can pick money. You, you absolutely can pick money. That's all right. Who picked the work? OK, so if you hate, if you hate the people, not making a lot of money, but you enjoy what you're doing, that's enough. Feels like that's the better of the three. Okay, and who picked the people? That is often the, the, the split that I've seen, uh, and, and, and it's gonna come up. Cool, um, once you get there, and we'll come back to the people bit, and that's, that's very much a part of this, is what do I do, right? And that sort of flows for me almost logically, right? The edge that you have, the edge that anyone has, especially when you begin into something new, which is oftentimes where you can have the most impact, your edge really is your perspective. And when I say perspective, I don't necessarily mean your mental perspective. I mean the perspective that you've had because of the, the life you've lived, right? There probably is only one person with that perspective, right? The people that went to your high school, maybe a couple hundred. The people that went to your class, maybe 30. So that's, that's a smaller list. The people went to your class and went to your college, probably a smaller number. The people that have walked the exact path that you've walked is probably one. And there is a unique perspective in there if you find it. A lot of successful companies that, that I've seen focus on that edge. You know, they focus on, hey, I know how something works here. Or maybe I have you know, unfettered access to my parents. It's maybe one person or up to five. I'm hoping your parents don't have more than five kids. Uh, 
people that have you know, incredible access to those two people that are your parents. That's an edge. That's an edge that I promise you I've seen people turn into massive companies. What your perspective does for you is gives you problems. Oftentimes people flip those things and jump right to a product. And the question becomes, what product do I want to build? The question that comes before that is, what problem do I want to solve? Because you solve problems, and you solve enough of them, and well, and you get rewarded for it. That's the ideal path. And I'm, you know, this is a, a little sweary, but this is Bill Gates talking about Facebook. And it applies to, I think, the wider world of uh, companies, which is, if you can solve a large enough problem, and you can either solve a big enough problem or create economic value through creating, solving that problem, you can capture a part of it for yourself. That's what most companies do. They create more value than they capture. Un unless you're a monopoly, in which case you can you know, capture up to 99% of it. But in most cases, you create more than you capture. Once you've got your problems, you find your solutions, and the solutions are your product. Um, in, in certain cases, like you know, early Apple or certain death cults, marketing is your product, where you're not necessarily selling what's here, you're selling you know, the, the vision of the future, you're selling problems of the future, you bring them into the present, you sell them, and you exchange that for, for capital. Okay, so uh, this is actually the simple one. This is the simple one that nobody wants to do. This is the simple one that I don't want to do. I hate that I have to do it, but this is, this is honestly the only answer. I'm gonna give you a few more alternatives, but don't think those are uh, genuine alternatives to talking to customers. You should talk to customers, day one. It's not fun, customers are scary. They have other things to do than talk to you. They don't wanna to talk to you. You're often trying to capture them from doing something they wanna do, but you should talk to customers. Customers can often lie to you. You know, Customers can tell you that, that they want your thing, but they don't actually want your thing, or they can tell you they hate it, but they might actually end up using it. You should still talk to customers. Customers don't want what you have. That's actually a really good signal. In most cases, they don't wanna do it. Uh, when you are an entrepreneur and you try and start a company, honestly, most of your life, even if, you, if you, even if you go in a corporate job and you try to do things there, your biggest enemy is the status quo. You're trying to change the status quo because you don't think it's good enough. And you're trying to find people who agree with you that it's bad enough and they're willing to put enough effort into it. Uh, most people jump further ahead and imagine the time when they are the status quo, when they're a big enough company or a medium-sized company and they start from there and go, this is how I'm gonna scale or circle. But oftentimes, you've got to get from here to there. You've got to get from that zero to one, and then one to 10. That's the hardest part, when the status quo is completely against you. And that's, that's your biggest challenge. And talking to customers is the only solution there. The more you talk to customers, the more you get a sense for, for how to do things. It's the same way that you know, if you want to make friends, you've got to talk to people. The more you talk to people, you find out why people don't like you. The more you talk to people, you find out who likes you. Right? And so there is genuinely no solution, uh, solution other than that iterative loop. Abhirshi, how do we find our first customers to talk to and how exactly should we talk to them? I think there's, there's a few different ways of doing it, especially now. Right? It used to be you had to pick up the phone. It used to be you had a massive Rolodex, you collected a bunch of phone numbers, then you'd sit there and cold call. I've been part of companies where, where that's all the CEO did, that's all the sales team did, is just go down a list of phone numbers and call people, like in uh, Wolf of Wall Street. That's how, you, that's how you talk to customers. Today, you're looking for not just talking to customers, you're looking for eyeballs, right? It's a lot of places that we go, there's a, in our phones, in our lives, you know, outside. So you're looking for places where you can reach customers. Oftentimes, just talking about what you do and who you are is a good place to reach them. Like you might even get inbound from doing that because in the early days especially, you're the product. When you're an early startup, you, the founders of the company, and the people in that company are often the product. People usually, I'd say my earliest customers were not people that bought what I made. They were buying me and my, and, and my co-founder and the people around me. They were buying our ability to build what they wanted, our ability to build into the future. So that oftentimes is your biggest product. And talking about that, I think, will help you find the customers that you want. But 90% of the time, there is just no substitute than finding those people and knocking on those doors. The worst that happens is no. Cool. Um, this is just a few additional things. Uh, this one's going to be controversial, and I honestly, this is the hill I'm going to die on, is be open with your ideas, right? I think stealth mode is one of the worst things that ever happened to startups, is be open entirely with your ideas, because your ideas suck. Every idea that has not met a customer, every idea that has not met enough people 
to have solidified around fixing all of the things that were wrong with it sucks, right? Anything that happens in a vacuum in your head, at best, is a good product for you as a customer. And in most cases, if you're the person starting this journey, if you're the person that's going about trying to change things and trying to build something new, you're likely a unique person. So it, rarely is it a good idea to build a product for yourself, because there may not be enough of you to use it. So be very, very open with your ideas. They're not usually the edge. Things usually win on execution more than idea. Uh, we did a little bit of an exercise in, uh, at the beginning, and it's, it's something worth you know, researching and sort of looking into. Almost every successful product or company or person won usually on the execution. I've seen bad ideas with great execution succeed all the time. It's almost a given. If I see a bad idea with great execution, I'm pretty sure it'll win. A good idea with bad execution almost never wins. Very, very rarely does that ever win. And finally, uh, these are just smaller things, which is you know, find specifically what your edge is and then polish it as much as you can. Because in most cases, people are buying the future of you. And I think the stock market sort of demonstrates that a little bit. It's all future discounted valuations. In most cases, people are buying your ability to move things forward and sort of build more. And there, polish matters more than you think. You think the thing that you built or the thing that you have or the service that you provide is what it is. But it's actually the polish that tells people that you can build more. So, I think some people are afraid that when they talk about their ideas, their ideas could be stolen. So how do you counter that? So there's, there's a couple of parts to that, right? I don't think ideas can be stolen as is. I think in a lot of places, we've left that land behind. Uh, it may be in AI, maybe in very, very young industries, something doesn't exist simply because nobody's thought about it. But in almost any case, including AI, I think, because a lot of smart people work in, that, in, in the field, uh, it's not because nobody's thought about it. Your biggest threat is going to be what you're not thinking of. Why hasn't anyone else done it? And the answer, this is the only wrong answer, is because I'm smarter than everybody else and I'm the first person to think of it. It really can't be that. In most cases, someone else has thought of it, probably started to do it, and then failed because of something you're not going to see. You're not going to see until you get there. So in most cases, talking about it is often the right idea. And the other part of it is no one can really steal your idea. If your idea is something that can be expressed in a sentence and stolen in a sentence and remembered in a sentence, it probably wasn't very good. Most of the time, the idea is the days and nights and hours that you've put into thinking about it, the research that you've done around it, your understanding of the nuances of how to deliver it and who wants it and where that's going to go. All of that's still in your head. And, and I don't think any amount of explaining you can do is ever going to get it into someone else's head. What they have is probably going to be something else. So this one, uh, to, you know, imagine there were just all of these really fun pictures back there you know, that you're not going to get to see for now. The, the final thing that I want to talk about is really just how to make all of this work, right? The, the first and last job you'll do as an entrepreneur is to keep the lights on. The first thing and the most important thing you'll do is make payroll. Once you've got employees and once you start hiring people, you make payroll. More than building product, more than finding customers, more than finding a market, you make payroll. And for that, you keep the lights on. Now, to keep the lights on, there's, these days there's two, two paths. There used to be a lot more paths, but they've all kind of joined together into two big ones. One of them, uh, one of them is VC. Everyone's kind of aware of it. The, we used to have LBOs. We used to have PE. We used to have a number of different things, micro and macro. Those have all largely congealed around VC just because of the outsized success that VCs had. We'll talk about why in the second point. Uh, the other path is bootstrapping. Right? And I strongly believe that no matter which way you go, you need to understand how the ecosystem works. Because oftentimes, find, find, founders get, uh, yeah, oftentimes founders get, find, founders get uh, blindsided because of things where they go, I, don't, I didn't really see that coming. I don't know what was happening there. Oftentimes, there's bigger forces than yourself at play. There are nation states and countries and large economies moving. Be aware of these things, right? Uh, the book by Brad Feld there, Brad Feld is kind of the, the go-to Bible there. There's a bunch of them. Venture Deals is kind of the Bible. A lot of it's gone a little bit out of date, but the fundamentals are right. Helps you understand market cycles. Helps you understand funds and stages and conditions. And that is, and now I'm just going to go into the VC side of things. If you're going to go out and try and get venture capital, understand that you only get one data point back, which is a yes or a no. But that data point's influenced by a large number of factors, the smallest one of which usually is you. 
So you get a yes, that, and you think, I did really well. Maybe, maybe not. You get a no, and you go, I really sucked at that. Maybe, maybe not, right? You want to understand things like what kind of a fund they have, what kind of promises they've made to LPs, what stage of that, the deployment of that fund they're in. All of those things are actively in play the minute you open a conversation with another person. Because you forget, they're kind of founders, you know? You're the product, their customers are the LPs, and they're just trying to you know, continue the loop and sort of close the cycle. So understanding how these things work is going to have more of an impact than you think. And it's going to make you far more prepared before you walk into a room. There's far smarter people than me, far better people than me that have done a far better job explaining that. So I'm just going to leave it there. So Rishi, how do you think we should identify when is the right moment to approach a VC? That's a good question. I, I, I still want to say that in the best case scenario, VCs approach you. Right? And that's going to show up later on in, in sort of how to get them to do that or how to get people to help you. Uh, because in most cases, there are also people trying to run companies. That deal flow oftentimes is their biggest advantage. So they're, they're actively trying to find you as much as you're trying to find them. So in the best case is they're going to approach you. But let's say in the instance that they don't, in the instance that you, that they, that you don't find them, find what the angle is. Right? When you know with some level of certainty what the angle actually is for them and for you and for everyone else, that's when you approach VCs. That's the right time, right? In the world of standard venture capital, which is now fragmented into quite a few things, that is when you can articulate in about you know, 30 seconds or 40 why you're a venture scale business. What your path to capturing that exponential outcome is, uh, is when you can start talking to VCs. Honestly, that's, that's pretty early, and that you can honestly go talk to a bunch of VCs at that point. So, Richard, what advice would you give to people that want to bootstrap the company from the start to the end? Bootstrapping, okay, let's talk about bootstrapping on number four, because number four is going to be entirely about really bootstrapping, but it applies everywhere else as well. The second one, and, and forgive me if I spend a little bit of time here, is understand zero interest rate phenomenons, because most of us, me included, have grown up, built companies, lived lives, you know, uh, heartbreak, all of these things under zero interest rates. And I think people are slowly starting to realize, but not soon enough, that a zero interest rate world is not what is happening now. And they are just very, very different animals. A lot of strategies, both personal and for a company and for a career, function in a zero interest rate world. So a zero interest rate, if, if, you, know, if you don't know, is just what the standard risk-free rate that a government, currently the US government, probably the seen as the stablest government in the world, is willing to give you for your money, right? Currently, I think that's standing well above zero. At one point, it was zero. At some point, European banks even went negative. So when interest rates are zero, capital, massive amounts of capital flies and looks for places to go. When that does, you know, growth is more valuable than revenue, right? Usage is more valuable than revenue. You get things like WeWork. If you go to the, you get things like WeWork, you get things like Fuzzy. Don't look up Fuzzy, it's not that fun, but, but that was a billion dollar company at some point. The unicorn as a class that companies aspire to was a ZERP, pretty much. So understand what that means for today. The companies being built today that will survive, the companies that get funded today that will survive, are companies that look very, very different than the companies of the last, you know, anything after 2008. I just thought it's contextual to ask. I'm, I'm Jaya, I run a startup community yeah. here. Um, and we work with a lot of early stage founders. And a lot of them aspire to get into programs like Antler, Accelerating Asia, and the best is, of course, Y Combinator. Um, I'm curious, related to VC, right? How do you, just like people shouldn't be just optimizing for raising capital. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the glamorization of programs like Y Combinator? And what's the biggest value you have got through the program? Those are all, okay, there's a bunch there, but those are all really great questions. Uh, in terms of the glamorization of those programs, I think I, you know, every hype cycle goes way above what actual value is. You know, anytime there's a hype cycle, whether that's about you know, office space or decentralization or something else, there's usually some value there. It, it almost never gets going without some value being there. But usually things way overshoot and way undercorrect. So do I think they're overvalued? Yes, right, definitely. Do I think there's a lot of value in there for the right people? Absolutely, yes. In most cases, you're looking to find, and this comes back to the original, you're looking to find people. If you run things yourself, it's often a lonely place, right? And I don't just mean that from a psychological perspective. Oftentimes, the force multiplier really is your network and people that know the right things, that know the right sentence at the right time, or the right person at the right time. So what a lot of these communities are trying to do, and they succeed more often than they don't, is in trying to connect you to those people. 
And of course, they take their pound of flesh for doing that. Uh, so if you're the right person, if you really feel like the odd man out, and sometimes you'll be able to tell almost immediately, it probably isn't for you. But there is still a lot of value in these things. In the case of Y Combinator, and in the case of, I think, you know, Antler is trying to do that. I think they're starting to succeed. Uh, what they can also do, and this is weird to say, is they can unionize entrepreneurs, right? Uh, very often, VC tends to be, which is on the other side, and customers tend to be, and partners on the other side, are all far more better organized than founders. Founders tend to largely just do their own thing. That means that there's almost no collective bargaining power. There's no enforcement or reputation mechanism. And that means that in markets where those things don't exist, like a lot of deep Asian markets, founders get treated really poorly because that information doesn't leave. There's not as much of a tight network, right? Terms, really onerous terms get, get floated by VCs. So in a lot of places, these networks function as unions for founders to sort of set uh, base level bargaining terms so that people don't get really screwed over. So there's a lot of value in at least them existing there. Cool. Uh, and so this I kind of covered a part of that is figure out where your network is and sort of really charge that network, right? And you do this by talking to people, being open about what you're doing. In most cases, realize that people actually want to help you, me included, right? The people that you meet and the people around you, they actually want to help you. In most cases, they can't because they don't know what you're doing. And it can be very easy to go into a hole and just sort of do things. Uh, and it's very hard to talk about something that's only 10% there or 5% there with all the worry that comes from that. But when you do, you'll find that people help you. When you do, you'll find that you actually create more spaces for those things to actually happen. Yeah, and this is, this is connected to that. So essentially, show progress. Uh, and this connects to uh, partly bootstrapping as well. Whatever you're doing, show as much progress as you can uh, to the rest of the world. Because you don't know where those connections will come in. If you think about the last product you bought, the last person you liked, the last person that was your friend, they probably did or said something that they didn't think was very important. It's just that they happen to say it to you at the right point in your life, at the right moment in your life. And you're creating more opportunities for that to happen the more you show progress and sort of build in public. Yeah. The, the final one, and there's a picture there if you pull it up. <laughs> this is, maybe you go forward. Yeah, this is, this is AI generated. This took a few tries. But no, it's, in, it's insane that AI has gotten good enough to do text now. Uh, the one thing to really understand, and more founders, that a lot of founders especially that I respect and look up to have said the same thing to me, uh, is, and this is especially important when you bootstrap, is understand your runway. Have an incredibly tight grip on your runway. And I don't mean financial. Financial is usually the least important one. Your personal runway, that means your relationships with people, the people you value in your life, that is a consumable resource if you treat it like one. It's a renewable resource if you treat it like one. And most founders, especially when you get into building things, treat them like consumable resources and then they, they run out. So understand what your personal runway is. Understand what your emotional runway is because that can catch up to you. More companies I've seen fail due to burnout than running out of money or building the wrong thing. And I've just seen that happen a lot. So keep an eye on your runway. Your financial runway, that's the company one, is going to be the easiest one to keep track of because that's just a number in a spreadsheet. As long as you check that spreadsheet up and update that spreadsheet, you're fine. Uh, the other two are going to take a lot of work and, and pay attention. So the, the final one, and this is just going to be relatively short, is just around force multipliers. And you almost always, because remember, we talked about capturing exponential value, uh, is look for force multipliers. That might be somebody you know. That might be something specific. That might be your network, your background. Maybe you found a big bag of cash in the couch. Whatever it is, find what your force multipliers really are. And today, there's just one thing that kind of dominates everything, which is the, uh, which, which is, you know, uh, AI. And I think this has kind of started permeating the discourse almost to the point of, you know, some amount of rejection, natural rejection. But mostly, I just want to talk about a few unique things, right? Uh, because the one thing that's kind of clear to me and it's becoming clear to a lot of people is it's something it's impossible to ignore. Maybe you want to start a company in AI, maybe you don't, right? Maybe you, you'd rather just do its own thing and you have other things and you, you want to focus on other things. But it's, going, it's becoming increasingly harder to ignore and an easy force multiplier if you don't. So then the two questions become, uh, how do you be founder in a world with AI or an entrepreneur and how do you be an AI founder? And those, to me, have very different answers. The first one here is look for the commoditized pieces. Look for the largest pieces of AI. 
because they're trying to tackle the things that humans have tried to do for a long time. And we're now getting really successful. Processing large amounts of human data, that's not possible. Automati automating responses, marketing, sales. So large parts of these things are now getting automated. And so those are all things you have to do as a founder. You, those are all things you need as a company. And so they're oftentimes the best places to look because they give you the biggest force multipliers. The reverse kind of applies to you if you're an AI founder. If you're trying to build a company in AI, uh, for the love of God, please don't pick the big ones. There are far smarter people, and unless you can tell me what your edge is specific to that, maybe that is just where you grow up, and maybe that's, that's your specific perspective. Uh, it's unlikely you'll compete, because the prevailing narrative, and I agree, is that a lot of these large spaces like RAG uh, and a few other places are going to end up as winner-take-all markets. They might eventually be commoditized, but much like the early days of e-commerce, they, for quite a while, will be winner-take-all markets. So you want to be very careful as an AI founder going into that. Uh, and then you just want to look at what you can build, right? Like uh, the one hard rule that I say is definitely use it. Definitely use it as much as you can because we've created this thing and this new way of doing things. Uh, it's almost like coding or design or a bunch of other things. Uh, and the less familiar you are with it, the more you're going to be wrong about all of your preconceptions. The more you're going to be wrong about where it's useless and you're going to be wrong about where it's useful. Um, so that, that largely is just to go, you know, build into it. Don't build away from it, really. Worst thing you can do is ignore it. The, the example that I had was, and in a lot of ways, it is a force multiplier, a force multiplier because even as it starts doing some of these things for us, we get better, right? That, because that's, you know, that's one of my favorite graphs, is that is the, uh, the quality or sort of novelty of moves in Go after AlphaGo showed up and, and, and then just killed all of Go. Right? What happened there? And moves in terms of human moves. Right? So what happened is this entire field where of competitive, internationally competitive, very smart people working on it for the last sort of you know, 30 to 40 years, nothing really happened until AI showed up. And then a bunch of people started using AI to get better at their moves. And now we're discovering ways to play Go that we didn't even know existed. So that is going to happen, I think, across most every industry, most every job that you know. The question is where you're going to find yourself on it. Okay, so that's it for the presentation. For the next five minutes, we just open the floor up to questions. So if you have any questions,